Now it happened in those days, an edict came out from Augustus Caesar that the whole world should be registered. This first registration was made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to make the return each in his own city. And Joseph also went out from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth and the Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to make the return with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was pregnant. And it happened while they were there, the days of bringing forth were fulfilled. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in bandages and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Luke relates how it happened that Christ was born in the city of Bethlehem as his mother was living at a distance from her home when she was approaching to her confinement. And first, he sets aside the idea of human contrivance by saying that Joseph and Mary had left home and came to that place to make the return according to their family and tribe. If intentionally and on purpose they had changed their residence that Mary might bring forth her child in Bethlehem, we would have looked only at the human beings concerned. But as they have no other design than to obey the edict of Augustus, we readily acknowledge that they were led like blind persons by the hand of God to the place where Christ must be born. This may appear to be accidental as everything else which does not proceed from a direct human intention is ascribed by irreligious men to fortune, but we must not attend merely to the events themselves. We must remember all the prediction which was uttered by the prophet many centuries before. A comparison will clearly show it to have been an accomplished by the wonderful providence of God, that a registration was then enacted by Augustus Caesar, and that Joseph and Mary set out from home so as to arrive in Bethlehem at the very point of time. Thus we see that the holy servants of God, even though they wander from their design, unconscious where they are going, still kept the right path because God directed their steps. Nor is the providence of God less wonderful in employing the mandate of a tyrant to draw Mary from home, that the prophecy may be fulfilled. God had marked out by his prophet, as we shall afterwards see, the place where he determined that a son should be born. If Mary had not been constrained to do otherwise, she would have chosen to bring forth her child at home. Augustus orders a registration to take place in Judea, and each person to give his name that they may afterwards pay an annual tax, which they were formerly accustomed to pay to God. Thus, an ungodly man takes forcible possession of that which God was accustomed to demand from his people. It was, in effect, reducing the Jews to entire subjection, and forbidding them to be thenceforth reckoned as the people of God. Manners have been brought in this way to the last extremity, and the Jews appear to be cut off and alienated forever from the covenant of God. At the very time does God suddenly and contrary to universal expectation afford a remedy. What is more, he employs that wicked tyranny for the redemption of his people. For the governor, or whoever, was employed by Caesar for the purpose while he executes the commission entrusted to him, is unknown to himself God's herald, to call Mary to the place which God had appointed. And certainly Luke's whole narrative may well lead believers to acknowledge that Christ was led by the hand of God from his mother's belly. Psalm 22 verse 10. Nor is it of small consequence to the certainty of faith to know that Mary was drawn suddenly and contrary to her intention to Bethlehem that out of it might come forth, Micah 5, 2, the Redeemer, as he had been formally promised. One, the whole world. This figure of speech, by which the whole is taken for a part, or part of the whole, was in constant use among the Roman authors, and not not to be reckoned harsh. That this registration might be more tolerable and less odious, it was extended equally, I have no doubt, to all the provinces, though the rate of taxation may have been different. I consider this first registration to mean that the Jews being completely subdued were then loaded with a new and unwanted yoke. Others read it that this registration was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, but there is no probability in that view. The tax was indeed annual, but the registration did not take place every year. The meaning is that the Jews were far more heavily oppressed than they had formerly been. 
verse 7, because there was no room for them in the inn. We see here not only the great poverty of Joseph, but the cruel tyranny which admitted of no excuse but compelled Joseph to bring his wife along with him at an inconvenient season when she was near to the time of her delivery. Indeed, it is probable that those who were the descendants of the royal family were treated more harshly and disdainfully than the rest. Joseph was not so devoid of feeling as to have no concern about his wife's delivery. He would gladly have avoided this necessity, but as that is impossible, he is forced to yield and commends himself to God. We see at the same time what sort of beginning the life of the Son of God had, and in what cradle he was placed. Such was his condition at his birth, because he had taken upon him our flesh for this purpose, that he might empty himself, Philippians 2, verse 7, on our account, when he was thrown into a stable and placed in a manger, and a lodging refused him among men. It was that heaven might be open to us, not as a temporary lodging, but as our eternal country and inheritance, and that angels might receive us into their abode. And there were shepherds in the same country abiding in the fields, and watching by night over their flock. Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they feared with a great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for lo, I announce to you great joy, which shall be to all the people. For this day is born to you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, in the city of David. And this shall be a sign to you, you shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling bands, laid in a manger. And suddenly there was present with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory in the highest to God, and on earth peace among men good will. Verse 8. And there were shepherds. It would have been to no purpose that Christ was born in Bethlehem if it had not been made known to the world. But the method of doing so, which is described by Luke, appears to the view of men very unsuitable. First, Christ is revealed but to a few witnesses, and that too amidst the darkness of night. Again, though God had at his command many honorable and distinguished witnesses, he passed by them and chose shepherds, persons of humble rank, and of no account among men. Here the reason and wisdom of the flesh must prove to be foolishness, and we must acknowledge that the foolishness of God, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 25, excels all the wisdom that exists, or appears to exist, in the world. But this too is a part of the emptying of himself, Philippians 2, verse 6. Not that any part of Christ's glory should be taken away by it, but that it should lie in concealment for a time. Again, as Paul reminds us that the gospel is mean according to the flesh, that our faith should stand in the power of the Spirit, not in the lofty words of human wisdom, or in any worldly splendor. So this inestimable treasure has been deposited by God from the beginning in earth and vessels, Second Corinthians 4, verse 7, that he might more fully try the obedience of our faith. If then we desire to come to Christ, let us not be ashamed to follow those whom the Lord in order to cast down the pride of the world, has taken from among the dung of cattle to be our instructors. Verse 9, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. He says that the glory of the Lord shone around the shepherds, by which they perceived him to be an angel. For it would have been of little avail to be told by an angel what is related by Luke if God had not testified by some outward sign that what they had heard proceeded from him. The angel appeared, not in an ordinary form or without majesty, but surrounded with the brightness of heavenly glory to affect powerfully the minds of the shepherds that they might receive the discourse which was addressed to them as coming from the mouth of God himself. Hence the fear of which Luke shortly afterwards speaks, by which God usually humbles the hearts of men, as I have formerly explained, and disposes them to receive his word with reverence. Verse 10. Fear not. The design of this exhortation is to alleviate their carnal fear, for though it is profitable for the minds of men to be struck with awe, that they may learn to give unto the Lord the glory due to his name, Psalm 29, 2. 
yet they have need at the same time of consolation, that they may not be altogether overwhelmed. For the majesty of God could not but swallow up the whole world, if there were not some mildness to mitigate the terror which it brings. And so the reprobate fall down lifeless at the sight of God, because he appears to them in no other character than that of a judge. But to revive the minds of the shepherds, the angel declares that he was sent to them for a different purpose, to announce to them the mercy of God. When men hear this single word that God has reconciled to them, it not only raises up those who are fallen down, but restores those who were ruined and recalls them from death to life. The angel opens his discourse by saying that he announces great joy, and next assigns the ground or manner of joy that a Savior is born. These words show us, first, that until men have peace with God and are reconciled to him through the grace of Christ, all the joy that they experience is deceitful and of short duration. Ungodly men frequently indulge in frantic and intoxicating mirth, but if there be none to make peace between them and God, the hidden stings of conscience must produce fearful torment. Besides, to whatever extent they may flatter themselves in luxurious indulgence, their own lusts are so many tormentors. The commencement of solid joy is to perceive the fatherly love of God toward us, which alone gives tranquility to our minds. And this joy in which Paul tells us the kingdom of God consists is in the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, verse 17. By calling it great joy, he shows us not only that we ought above all things to rejoice in the salvation brought us by Christ, but that this blessing is so great and boundless as fully to compensate for all the pains distresses, and anxieties of the present life. Let us learn to be so delighted with Christ alone that the perception of his grace may overcome and at length remove from us all the distresses of the flesh. We shall be to all the people. Though the angel addresses the shepherds alone, yet he plainly states that the message of salvation which he brings is of wider extent, so that not only they in their private capacity may hear it, but that others may also hear. Now let it be understood that this joy was common to all people because it was indiscriminately offered to all. For God had promised Christ, not to one person or to another, but to the whole seed of Abraham. If the Jews were deprived for the most part of the joy that was offered to them, it arose from their unbelief. It says that the present day God invites all indiscriminately to salvation through the gospel, but the ingratitude of the world is the reason why this grace, which is equally offered to all, is enjoyed by so few. Although this joy is confined to a few persons, yet with respect to God it is said to be common. When the angel says that this joy shall be to all the people, he speaks of the chosen people only. But now that the middle wall of partition, Ephesians 2 verse 14, has been thrown down, the same message has reference to the whole human race. For Christ proclaims peace not only to them that are nigh, but to them that are far off, Ephesians 2.17. To strangers, Ephesians 2.12, with citizens. But as the peculiar covenant with the Jews lasted until the resurrection of Christ, so the angel separates them from the rest of the nations. Verse 11. This day is born to you. Here, as we lately hinted, the angel expresses the cause of the joy. This day is born, the Redeemer long ago promised, who was to restore the church of God to its proper condition. The angel does not speak of it as a thing altogether unknown. He opens his embassy by referring to the law and the prophets. Had he been addressing heathens or irreligious persons, it would have been of no use to employ this mode of speaking. This day is born to you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. For the same reason, he mentions that he was born in the city of David, which could serve no purpose, but to recall the remembrance of those promises which were universally known among the Jews. Lastly, the angel adapted his discourse to hearers who were not altogether unacquainted with the promised redemption. With the doctrine of the law and the prophets, he joined the gospel, as emanating from the same source. And this shall be a sign to you. The angel meets a prejudice which might naturally hinder the faith of the shepherds. 
For what a mockery is it that he whom God has sent to be the king and the only savior is seen lying in a manger? That the mean and despicable condition in which Christ was might not deter the shepherds from believing in Christ. The angel tells them beforehand what they would see. This method of proceeding, which might appear to the view of men absurd and almost ridiculous, the Lord pursues toward us every day. Sending down to us from heaven the word of the gospel, he enjoins us to embrace Christ crucified, and holds out to us signs and earthly and fading elements which raise us to the glory of a blessed immortality. Having promised to us spiritual righteousness, he places before our eyes a little water by a small portion of bread and wine. He seals the eternal life of the soul. But if the stable gave no offense whatever to the shepherds, so as to prevent them from going to Christ to obtain salvation, or from yielding to his authority while he was yet a child, no sign, however mean in itself, ought to hide his glory from our view, or prevent us from offering to him lowly adoration, now that he has ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. Verse 13, And suddenly there was present with the angel a multitude. An exhibition of divine splendor had been already made in the person of a single angel, but God determined to adorn his own son in a still more illustrious manner. This is done to confirm our faith as truly as that of the shepherds. Among men, the testimony of two or three witnesses, Matthew 18, verse 16, is sufficient to remove all doubt. But here is a heavenly host with one consent and one voice bearing testimony to the Son of God. What then would be our obstinacy if we refused to join with the choir of angels in singing the praises of our salvation, which is in Christ? As we infer how abominable in the sight of God must unbelief be, which disturbs this delightful harmony between heaven and earth. Again, we are convicted of more than brutal stupidity if our faith and our zeal to praise God are not inflamed by the song which the angels, with a view of supplying us with the manner of our praise, sang in full harmony. Still further, by this example of heavenly melody, the Lord intended to recommend to us the unity of faith and to exhort us to join with one consent in singing his praises on earth.